If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires upfield into the end zone. It is caught. Jelani Woods. Touchdown. He's going to fire upfield. It's broken up. Tip picked up. And intercepted by the Colts. This is the official Colts podcast, giving you an updated look at what's new with the horseshoes. Colts have it. Interception. Two seconds left. And the Colts are going to win. In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. This is the Colts official podcast brought to you by our friends at Win Las Vegas. Um, I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm not a big couch guy. Yeah, no. See, this is this is a bad take. No, we were talking this isn't about, a bad no, take. no, 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 no. I, 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 the, the couch in general. I want to talk it, and then I'll let you guys go. I mean, it's. It's the mo- if you're if you're going in your friend's house, no one's picking the couch. I'm thinking to sit down. In my opinion, because you, it's a it's community you bus. Number one, number two is <laughs> JJ and I look like we're an item. All right, when you're sitting on a couch like this, maybe we should hold hands. I'm just I, saying, I, 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 the couch is for one thing and one thing only. It's a quick sit at your neighbors, and you're like, hey, thanks so much. I'll have the propane tank. I'll leave it right there. Okay, up. And the next thing is for naps on a Sunday. That's about it because this thing here, you can't Wait, sit in the middle. Wait, if you're hanging out at home, where do you sit? Like, where are you lounging? I have dedicated chairs, much like you do, that are like really, but not a couch. I'm a, I'm a. Solo oh my god, I guy. live on my couch. Yeah, like, you I lay fall, on your couch. Oh my god, I just don't think you I have will, a good couch. I'll fall asleep four nights a week on my couch. But you're laying down. Yeah, I'm okay with that. It's a great. It's a it's a day bed. I mean, that's what yeah. I'm saying. It's a day bed, which is perfect. But for entertaining and stuff like this, like you're watching on the YouTube oh, channel see, right we've now, got I'm gonna like be a... like this, <laughs> and then I'll be like this. Yeah, well, I will see. I fidget, I and do fidget. Really fidget. You'll do notice. Is... I usually go to this. This yeah. is yeah. my my standard when I'm sitting right here. Wait, do you have like a sectional? No, no, no. It's a standard. It's bigger than this. See, it's I I this. feel like a sectional is more. Yeah inviting we we gather we're big yeah like yeah. even my parents like even like my my family in addition to like we're yeah we're big couch yeah we, we, have, we have couch chair chair if you invite me over i'm chair chair i know guy. you're i know you're going to one of the chairs but yeah. the rest of us are going to be on the couch That's we got right. a three-seater and, and very and, comfortable and, and by the way you can't be comfortable on a couch with three seats again, yeah you can again we got the crevice in the middle nah. you're losing half your backside you, there are there. three cushions you got to have a three cushion couch That's a good point yeah but, but this is again, a two cushion exactly but then what do you open up though you open up side thing you got two more uh crevices in there that you can sink in so no no you one person on one cushion one person on one cushion one push person on one cushion that's okay. it if i'm staying like this which i'm going to do for the rest of the show one of the most uncomfortable positions i can be in i think you week. got your your couch when it fell off the back of a truck no 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 it's a good one it's a beauty believe me i was i was i'm happy with it but again it's a day bed and that's my take. I, that's the open for this. This is that. <laughs> this is that. I, it, seriously, one of the worst takes I've ever heard. I'm there. There's couch Can't people do out there that are going to yeah. be like cussing at me and me. everything like that. But then there's people like that get it. That you know the solo. You okay, look, are you are you, you a recliner great. guy? Thanks. You got you got a recliner like the lazy bear. Where you pull the thing out and you kick your feet up. No, and, I no. I okay, have, I have I have. You uh, got ottomans. Ottoman, ottoman, yeah. Okay. yeah, I have two All different right. ottomans that you can work and different heights too. Because sometimes the lower back a little bit like this. Oh, that's a good idea. All right, okay. I'm not saying much now, but. I'm going to do my best for the next, you know, 30 minutes or so to stay comfortable. Do you want to trade? Like, do you want me to get up? Do you want to like, oh, no, no, like, no, no. Uh, you look great over there, by the oh, way, you're the best part of this show as it is. So I'm not going to screw that up. So I do. I do like my right situation. There. Cause I've got like, I've got armrests, yeah. you know, yeah. I am. I I'm getting cozy. Your eyes because I've got, yeah. I'm, what I'm is happening? A little bit there, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. We're going to make it good. No, All no, right. Uh, let's start yeah. this thing up again. The Colts official podcast brought to you by our friends at win Las Vegas, JJ Stankovitz, Lara Overton, a lot to go over today. It's going to be about a player returning it's about a player that's not returning and it's about a player that we're happy is returning for years to come just want to glance over two overtime games one win one loss your takeaway quickly because we got the Tennessee Titans coming up and some stuff to talk about about what's going on in the back there in that locker room JJ Uh, I just want to say this about the the game on Sunday the crowd at Lucas Oil Stadium was awesome like for it to be 23 nothing and stuck when, around. When, when this stuck around, and when Anthony Richardson hit that touchdown to Moelle Cox, and then Kenny Moore gets the interception right after that, it was just all bets off. And I gotta say, the the touchdown song, the da 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 da, da it was bumping. Yeah, people were in the fourth quarter. That. People were, I'm like, I they're no getting idea. into it. Yeah, Pat McAfee's into right. it. Like I was, the atmosphere in the fourth quarter 
was one of the best football atmospheres I've ever experienced. And you were down there on the carpet, so you heard it and you saw uh, it. Not yeah, only. and you know, we were talking on the radio broadcast back in Baltimore about how deafening it was uh, in the situation, actually, which led to the safety uh, there and just how loud and how overpowering and dominating that crowd was in that situation. And on Sunday afternoon, Lucas Oil Stadium, I felt the same way, mm -hmm. like with how Colts fans were uh, when the Rams offense was out on the field. So, yeah, I mean, it was electric down there. Um, it was so much fun. There were people <laughs> reaching over, since I am down on the field, reaching over uh, the barrier there and like high-fiving. And I, so I'm going, running back and forth you know, trying to grab injury updates and stuff. And just It was awesome. It was, you felt like you were in a parade, you know? You're just like waving. Everybody's all excited and hyped up. So I think, you know, obviously there are no moral victories and everyone is disappointing with not being able to pull off the comeback and certainly examining why you fell into that 23-point deficit early on and making no excuses for doing that. But there is a lot to be excited about and a lot to build with on, build from when you look back. Let me stay there for one second. This is to you. Okay. He's good. He is good on game <laughs> oh, days. Oh, yeah. He is yeah. really, really, really good Thank on you, game Jeffrey. days for doing this. And what I'm talking about is the PA announcing at Lucas Oil Stadium and calling the plays and giving updates and everything that you do. Bro, you knock it out of the park and you talk about a, a, an environment, you're responsible partly for that. So hats so, off if I now, had one. So, I'm giving JJ props yeah. on that. Here's, He's great. You're kind of the stadium hype man for yeah. like 68,000 68, yeah. people. It is pretty fun to, you know, like get people to boo just like on your command. <laughs> like, please welcome head coach Sean McVay and the Los Angeles Rams. Boo! Like having that, having that power is pretty cool. Well done. Um, but okay, so well I thought done. my my favorite thing that uh, I got to do on Sunday was I think it was at the start of overtime or it was when the Rams had the ball in the fourth quarter, and I've been kind of doing like when the Rams take the field, like all right, come on, like let's make some noise like that, and I just went like, all right, Colts fans, it's first and ten for the Rams on the twenty five yard line. The place went nuts. Yeah, like just kind of like. Let them let go with it. Let them take it. Put it on These are seat. smart fans. You guys know what to do. I didn't have to say, make noise, get loud. You, they just, you know, everyone in that building knew what to do in that moment, and it was really cool. Well, keep up the great work because, like I said, I think you're one of the – for doing it not as long as you have, JJ, hats off again because it's great, and you are a big part of that environment. So, Colts fans all over our – and, and Lara, this came out when Shane Steichen talked earlier in the week. Uh, I, I want to get right to it. JT, what does it mm -hmm. look like with JT this week? If you guys can walk me through what yeah. his week looks like, and more importantly, what's his Sunday look like? Well, initially when we heard from Coach Steichen, it was JT uh, will return to practice on Wednesday, and then he did not rule out Jonathan Taylor's availability for Sunday against the Titans. After we heard from Coach, there was a modified schedule that came out because it's it's our indication, our understanding, that coming off of the back-to-back -back overtime games, they decided to make Wednesday a walkthrough as opposed to having three straight days of practices. Obviously, the Colts dealing with a number of different injury issues. Now, Quiddy Pay in the concussion protocol. Mm -hmm. Ryan Kelly and Bernard Ryman still progressing through concussion protocol along with a number of different things. You know, we saw DeForest Buckner on a pitch count last week. So just as a way to modify how they're treating the week to preserve people, let people heal up a little bit, rather than go through that full practice necessarily on Wednesday. So they'll do a walkthrough there. That would mean Jonathan Taylor would likely practice Thursday, Friday. And Coach Steichen said that he had the opportunity to talk with Jonathan. He's excited. He's ready to come back. You're going to come back. You know, seems like that – uh, there is a unified front in terms of you know how they're approaching bringing him back in, using him as an incredible weapon and asset within this offense. How intriguing is it to think about the development of Anthony Richardson, what Zach Moss has given you in the run game, and you add Jonathan Taylor to that? That's so, so intriguing. You also wonder, is this something where you're going to throw it out there and say it's certainly a possibility, not rule it out, because it's also a little bit of, you know, coaching strategy and chess mats you got to put got to put a seat of doubt uh in Tennessee's mind to think we at least have to game plan for the possibility right. that he could play so the logistically Jonathan Taylor has not been activated from PUP yet the Colts are opening a 21 day window when he hits the practice field for the first time in that window he can be activated so you don't have to put him out there on Sunday if you he goes through practice, you know, full practice Thursday, full practice Friday, whatever it may look like. 
and you say, yeah, you know what? It's probably smarter if we hold you back. How late can he be activated, though? For, I'm just off for it this. Could be, so we got week five, week six, week seven. I think it would be as late as week eight. This week no, I'm you mean, you, about. You're talking oh. like Saturday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it would be Saturday. Saturday. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, one thing to keep in mind, though, too, is if Jonathan Taylor only has two opportunities to practice this week, what kind of football shape is he in? Mm. What type of conditioning is he in? How quickly is he able to get up to speed with this offense? He hasn't taken a handoff from Anthony Richardson yet. Jonathan Taylor hasn't been on the football field, hasn't taken contact since December of 2022. So I do think, I mean, that's a pretty tall order for him to be ready to play, but he is also a very he's a special player. So yeah. I'm not you know dismissing that the at all, but I do think that this would be a, a pretty massive undertaking to feel like that he is prepared and you're putting him in a, and you put him in a position to be successful as right. well. Here, here's the flip side to this. Um, this is something that I learned when I was covering the Bears. Sometimes great players, you just put them out there. Yeah. Like I, Khalil Mack, when the Bears traded for Khalil Mack in 2018, it was on Labor Day weekend, he hadn't practiced football once. Until he got to Chicago, he had three practices. He hit the field in Green Bay. He played the greatest half of football I've ever seen a player play. Really? Well, I mean, how many times do we see Ty do stuff like that? You know, what exactly. I mean? Yeah, I mean, we, like, that's that's everyone kind of came to expect. Where it was like no one was concerned if Ty didn't practice all week because you know he's going to show up, pop off, give you everything that he would regardless. So. so sometimes, you know, that's why I think Shane Steichen is also saying, yeah, there's a possibility that he could play because if you can get Jonathan Taylor on the field. Even if it's for five snaps, ten snaps, whatever it may be, that's a weapon. It doesn't mean he's going to get ten touches. It means you. I mean, think about how you could use him as a decoy in this game potentially. Well, also just game. any opportunity to help balance out this heavy workload that Zach Moss has yeah. carried through. You know, three games out of the first four as well. Maybe a little bit, a little bit of balance that you can provide in that regard too to trade off. So that I mean, because when Zach runs. Zach runs hard, and Zach yeah. is a punishing runner. John, J Jonathan Taylor is a little bit of a different element to that. So if you can also help break up the you know the workload and the toll that it's taking on Zach Moss, that's a great you know opportunity as well. Zach Moss snap percentages in in his three games a season ninety eight point two percent against the Texans. Dude's incredible. Seventy six point two percent against the Ravens, then eighty two point eight percent against the Rams, and those last two games being in overtime. I mean. First of all, what a workhorse he yeah. is that you can keep giving him the ball Angry and get those runner. yards. Um, but there's probably opportunity there for the Colts to say, my do we really is, need him out there that much? My question, guys, and, and help me and we'll move on. If he doesn't, if he isn't activated for this game, he's activated a little bit for Jacksonville. What's after Jacksonville? Cleveland or something Cleveland like that? Cleveland and New Orleans at yeah, home. Yeah, so Tennessee. My, what does it look like with a, with a backfield with those two? in a Shane Steichen offense, and I'm talking about at this point where we're not doing five to seven carries for JT, mm -hmm. we're in like he's in full go mode. Yeah, I think that a bit of it, you kind of think back to what you envision, and this isn't identical because these guys aren't, you know, carbon copy and they are very different uh, athletes, different assets for the offense, but you think about when Jonathan Taylor was drafted and the compliment that he was expected to be to Marlon Mack, and you thought about it as this, you know, 1A, 1B, it's RB1, basically the thunder and lightning mm -hmm. type of combination. That's what everyone kind of wanted that to be and what everyone expected that to be. And then the unfortunate injury to Marlon Mack and Jonathan Taylor got thrust into that starting role and you didn't ever have the opportunity to really see what that tandem could be at full health, at full steam. That's a little bit kind of how I think about the – you know, position that this puts you in because you do have such a powerful runner with Zach Moss, the way he's able to take tacklers with him. And then you have obviously the incredible elusive speed, that kind of game breaking speed that Jonathan Taylor has as well. It's an interesting tandem. I mean, Jonathan Taylor's a home run hitter. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Shane Steichen was talking about on Monday. And, you know, I think you could definitely envision both those guys in this backfield where. If Zach Moss is a short yardage third down guy who can also step in for a couple of series and be really efficient running the ball, like baseline, that is a benefit to the Colts offense. Zach Moss can still earn carries in this offense. I mean, we've seen it in Philly in the last couple of years. Like Philly this year, <laughs> on their first depth chart of the season, they listed four starting running backs. Right. And it's turned out to be more of DeAndre Swift there. But they, I think Shane comes from the school of riding the hot hand. 
And if the hot hand one week is Jonathan Taylor, all right. If the hot hand one week is Zach Moss, all right. What does the game plan call for and kind of go from there? I also like the thought of let Zach Moss grind down some defenses and bully through some defenses and then throw JT in there for like, you know, that jolt to, you know, punch that, you know, kind of that home run hitter, you know, you're switching speeds and, you know, trying to wear defenses down, grind them down a little bit, and then capitalize on that with these versatile weapons that you have. You know, I think as we were looking at this season and you're kind of wondering, you know, what's JT's status going to be? Is he going to be on the team? Is he going to be available? To now have him coming back when you have Zach Moss running the way that he is, no matter how it shakes out, that is good news for the Colts offense, and it's really good news for Anthony Absolutely. Richardson. Absolutely. We're going to find out. And Colts fans, if you want the latest, if you want the greatest, you know where to go. How about Twitter, formerly known as X? X, formerly <laughs> yeah, known definitely. as Twitter, rather than that, at Lara Overton, at J.J. Stankovitz, and, of course, everything at Colts.com. Can't and wait. at Hey Gorman. And at Hey Gorman, hey Gorman. That's right. I don't tweet a lot, but I should. But, but No, you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's <laughs> saying no? Silly. Don't dive Just, in? No, nah, it, it, it's silly. Okay. I'm that, no, no, no. Your your tweets are great. You had this one tweet, like Whoa. right when I started, and your t- your tweet was essentially like the best part of my the best part of waking up is not Folgers in my cup. Stop saying that. Yes, it's not. And that was that's one right. of my introductions it to Jeffrey Gorman. I mean, that's just like eating, drinking. Wait, that was your introduction, to Jeffrey Gorman. It was, Jeffrey I've Gorman that and I tweet. go back to like what 2012. Oh yeah, we were I mean, talking morning show. At that yeah, we sure were. I mean, we're a solid. We're a decade. Well, I, didn't, strong, I never saw. I never saw Dark Waters, so that was one that's of my true. first introductions. But no, my first yeah. introduction to you was uh, what? Which way I'm taking into work? And plus, am I? That's exactly right. Yeah, is 56th Street? Yeah, hello, Larry. <laughs> telling me to go around this morning when you were right. over at Fox. So, all right. Um, I, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for that thing. The Folgers. No, I'm not a Folgers guy. That's kind of a, you know, cow patty that's microwave. <laughs> so I'm out of it. But anyway, great coffee around town. Let's keep moving on. We're talking about the, you know, everybody excited about JT coming back. What we have with Zach Moss. Uh, we say goodbye to Dallas Flowers. Yeah. And we got to go into that because the secondary is so young. And Gus Bradley's, you know, he, he knows that he's got some talent back there. But, boy, oh, boy, this is a tough one because that mm-hmm. cat was doing some great things. And we didn't hear about him a lot, which is a great yep. thing. But Dallas Flowers, what do we look like now? I'm asking both of you this. What do we look like now in the defensive backfield as far as snap counts go? Yeah, it's going to be interesting if the Colts go to Jalen Jones at that spot. Uh, Daryl Baker Jr. would be in the mix. But, you know, you look at what happened during training camp, and Daryl Baker Jr. was kind of playing that more press spot that now Juju Brents is in. He never, you know, it was Daryl and Dallas were the two guys during training camp. Dallas playing more of that kind of off coverage on the other side. He was having a really solid season. I thought these last two games, you started to see him really take off. And he made some plays against the Rams that were spectacular pass breakups, physical pass breakups. Um, just a, a this one hurts, man. It it uh, what a bummer for him because yeah. you think about an undrafted free agent starting at cornerback in year two, these opportunities don't come along that often, and he it looked like he was starting to make the most of it. Just a gut punch for him. We'll see if it's Jalen Jones. We'll see if it's Daryl Baker Jr. Kind of as this week goes on once we get into Tennessee. But DeAndre Hopkins coming to town. I mean. You got to be ready for that wherever he lines up. That's King for sure. King Henry's been known to jump throw too. Don't forget. You all oh, you, boy, saw you, it last week <laughs> against Cincinnati. You better be ready to tackle too, because that cornerback. I mean, you, it's all hands on deck to bring down Derrick Henry. Right. Right. Hello, Dallas. What are the um, like? You know, oh. the snap count likes what I'm talking about. But those young guys you mentioned, Jalen Jones. That. Uh, you know, that's a long sort of, you know, similar to Juju guy. I mean, long reach, long everything yeah. like that. Is this secondary going to look re- – I mean, it'll it'll look young for the rest of the year regardless, and that's, unless there's a veteran move made. Well, I think one of the encouraging points for me is you look at the way that, you know, Ron Miles and Mike Mitchell and Gus Bradley developed – a guy like Dallas Flowers and, you know, what he was able to do uh, with Daryl Baker and, you know, really coach those guys up. And, I mean, last year, Dallas emerged and made himself known and far exceeded, I think, what a lot of people's expectations were when he was thrust into, you know, critical situations and earned himself enormous playing time outside of just that special teams role. So that gives me a lot of confidence in what, Coach Milas and that team within the secondary can do with 
a guy like Jalen Jones and continuing with Juju Brents to see what those guys are able to do and what they're able to give you. Uh, and, you know, they've, they, you have Kenny back there as well. You've got great vets with Kenny and Julian Blackman in that secondary who will help those guys. And, you know, they're kind of out there in terms of being the vocal pieces, helping communicate, helping guys get in great positions. So it is one of those, you know, this is why – you used the amount of draft capital you did on the cornerback situ- on the mm-hmm. cornerback position, right? Like you had three of your draft picks were corners, uh, and Jalen Jones was so impressive over the course of camp in the preseason that Chris Ballard noted him like three different times yeah. in different media. Well, and he said he was the reason why Darius Rush is on the roster, right? So I think all of those that makes him in- intriguing, and you know it's exciting for me. But man, devastating for Dallas because he is such an easy guy to root for earned every opportunity that he was getting. And, I mean, look at the plays he made, you know, over the course of those first four games prior to the injury. You know, he was he was doing it all, doing everything that was asked of him. So, a devastating situation, one of those things that, unfortunately, you know is inevitable over the course of this season. And, you know, this is why you have that mentality of having young talent in there and being able to coach them up and – Everybody's going to get thrust into a situation at some point, thrust into that starting position. So now it's your time to go and prove why. Hey, real, real quick, before we move on to uh, Anthony Richardson, I, I wanted to get this in in the last segment talking about Zach Moss because last week on this podcast we were like, oh, what's a Ute? Talking about Utah. Oh, yeah. And we got an answer from uh, at Kimbry in our YouTube comments. The Utes are an indigenous people who lived in the area. They have a special relationship with the University of Utah, which includes scholarships, education campaigns, and additional support. I loved Ute Pride sporting events. So oh, okay, that's so great. It is it's now a, we know it's an it's a Native American population. How about that? Um, and I say this now to we you. know more. I say this to you, Miss Hoosier, because mm-hmm. you literally are Miss Hoosier in my eyes. You've born and raised here. Yeah, went to IU, uh, represent the state and the city of Indianapolis so well out through your whole career and everything. But a Hoosier is just a nickname. It is. It's yes. not a you. It's just a folk tale. It's like, just yeah, a folk tale, there's right? like, yeah, it's just someone from Indiana. There's all sorts of, you know, kind of funny anecdotes as to the origin of Hoosier. Um, you know, there's the it came from someone yelling "Who's there?" or "Who's ear?" and all all these different. Really, who's here? Who's here? Who who's ear? Who's here? Who's ear is what it like? I don't you know. Mean someone, like, like, no, who's like ear? there was an ear that was found, and it was like, oh, who's oh, who's ear? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you, you a could... question because I don't know. I've been here a while working for the Colts, but uh, longer than JJ has. You've been here a couple years mm-hmm. plus. Yeah, is JJ considered a Hoosier? Uh, Ooh. yeah, I would say so. You're okay. a Hoosier. Yeah. Oh, congrats. Okay. I mean, hey, you thanks. Do, you do own property in the state. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. I would think so. I mean, you know, I've. I'm putting roots down here. Hoosier. I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. All yeah. right, Hoosiers that are out there listening, back-to-back home games. We saw something. I want to talk about this because I'm going to shut up because you guys are going to just rave about what we saw out of number five a couple of days ago on the field, leading a comeback in Anthony Richardson and stuff. But he has played, oh, maybe 16 games of adult football in his life. And I'm saying this because – Practice, he wasn't getting hit down at Florida, you know, with the yeah, red jersey right. on and whatnot. And he saw 13 games when he was there, and then he comes out here. So, really, in, in 16, I'm throwing some preseason action in there, too, 16, 17 times that he's really played adult football for real. And to see what he did in those few games that he's played adult football with the speed around it, the violence and the collision around it, I'm blown away. The two-point conversion, the throw to Pierce, but the, uh, you know, those are just my things that everybody else saw. But you guys know that this cat is different, this cat is special, and this cat, if he is around for a long time, my gosh, success everywhere with Anthony right. Richardson. So here's, here's, I think, the context we need to start with, mm-hmm. talking about Anthony Richardson. We're talking about big boy football, adult right. football. So in this state... There are four teams that you could say probably play big boy adult football. Sure. Sorry, Ball State. We're talking Power Five football here. Okay. Notre Dame, Indiana, Purdue, the Colts. The starting quarterbacks of those teams of Indiana, Taven Jackson, born on January 5th, 2004, his little baby. Of the Purdue Boilermakers, Hudson Card, born on July 29th, 2001. Of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, Sam Hartman, born on July 29th, 1999. Of big the Sam. Indianapolis big Colts. Sam, big Sam Hartman fan, by the way. Anthony Richardson, born on May 22nd, 2002. Anthony Richardson is younger than two of the four 
two of the three starting quarterbacks of the major Whoa. big Power Five right football in programs state. in this state. He, Sam Hartman is like three years older than Anthony Richardson. Yeah, because yeah, that guy's taking uh, Wake Forest. Yeah, I mean, good, good for him. COVID good for him. Year, like, yeah. yeah, great. Uh, love Sam Hartman too. Uh, but I mean, my goodness, Anthony Richardson's twenty-one years old. Like you said, Jeffrey, he's played what sixteen games. Mm-hmm. I mean. And the throws that he's making and the decisions that he's making. No, 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 no. Not even just the, like not even just the throw with Aaron Donald completely draped all over him, a defensive player of the year, future Hall of Famer, and connects with Alec Pierce for a thirty plus yard like, bomb. So when when like, I put on the wh- throw by itself, but then you talk about with that guy in yeah. your face, not even just in your face, like hanging on you, like bear hugging you. Like nearly. and by the way, that so that play Anthony had to slide a little bit to his left because of pressure from his right. And because he slid a little bit to his left, it's those little subtle pocket movements that we've been talking about with Anthony that he's really good at. Okay, here comes Aaron Donald. When you put on the All-22 film of that throw, it doesn't Did even... Did he oh, jump? yeah, yeah, he's in the air. It's a jump throw, right? Yeah. The camera doesn't even zoom out enough to see the catch because whoever's operating the camera, understandably, is like... Pfft, there's no way this ball's going that far. Oh my God, it's going that far. Like that, he's making plays that there are three other quarterbacks in the can NFL who can make those throws. You know, you think about Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, and I'm not comparing him to those guys just, in terms of their what he's doing, but like just the talent, mm. the arm talent that he has is just unreal. And then you, you think about the natural quarterbacking ability that he has. There's still things he needs to develop at and get better at, certainly. But it's those subtle pocket movements. He does not take a lot of sacks. The two-point conversion where he throws it to Zach Moss. On that play, he gets pressured by Aaron Donald in like a second and a half. How many quarterbacks in the NFL would have just gone into a turtle shell and been like, all right, this play's dead? He just danced out and went left. He made made Aaron Donald whiff. (laughs) Like, I mean, it's like, you know, a pitcher thrown to a White Sox batter this year, just like swing and a miss. Like, it was incredible the the way that he just made Aaron Donald miss, and then he fights through the trash in the pocket to get outside, baits the linebacker to come in, just dumps it over his head, two-point conversion, like special stuff that he's doing. And here's the thing is, as impressive as it is, I'm not at all surprised by any of it. Yeah. Because this is exactly what we had heard time and time again from the time he walked in the building, was reinforced in training camp, that Anthony Richardson is just, you know, he is unfazed. Like, you can't rattle this guy. He is so even keel. He does not flinch. I think that was the exact description that Chris Ballard said. Definitely, like, does not flinch. Like, to have that amount of poise and command is just remarkable. But again, not at all surprising because this is what we have come to expect from him since we started seeing him out there on the field, obviously wasn't facing, you know, full pressure, full contact, all of that. But this is exactly as advertised everything that you have wanted to see and have heard about that he was so highly touted for in the NFL draft is all coming to fruition. Have you guys guys heard anything from his teammates? Because I know it's early and we're going to be talking all week to the teammates about the upcoming game, but a little bit about Anthony. Have you heard when down 23-0, like what what, what he was saying to his teammates? I mean, well, so – I was catching up with Zach Moss okay. after the game, and, and something he said is, like, you just see the moments not too big for him. Yeah. But these guys know that that's because he put the work in. Zach was talking about, you think about all the work he's put in from OTAs to now. He didn't cheat any day. Mm-hmm. And he gets out there, and, okay, we're down 23 nothing. He's not forcing passes. He's not speeding up his timing. He's just going out there and... He's not worried about the score. He's not worried about Aaron Donald. He's not worried about Matthew Stafford throwing fireballs on the other side. He's like, let's go out there and execute these plays just like we've practiced. And that that poise, that mentality that he has, I mean, there are rookies who in that situation would have just kind of folded under the pressure of that game, but he didn't. And it's not just what 
you know, he does or what he says, but it's also on how he uses what's around him. Because I was watching Anthony in some of these situations uh, on Sunday as I was behind the bench and I saw him, you know, when he came back um, after a three and out, sat next to Gardner Minshew and they were just immediately like diving into conversation. They got out the surface and, you know, Gardner was giving him some instruction. I couldn't hear verbatim and it gets dangerous to try to do any sort of lip reading down there, but he's, he's taking it all in and he was responding, being very receptive receptive to whatever Gardner Minshew was telling him. Then there was another situation. This was later on in the game. I believe it was in the third quarter. And I heard Jim Bob Cooter walk up to him and he got in front of him. He was kneeling down. He's looking AR directly in the eye and he goes, hey, that's a good quarterback over there, but you're a darn good quarterback too. Just go get us one. And then Anthony immediately engineered that touchdown drive with the two-point conversion. Um, so that's the other thing is it's not so much that he has to have it all together, but yet he does have it all together. But it's also, you know, how am I taking what I'm hearing from the vets within my position group? A guy like Gardner Minshew who just led an overtime win last week, of course. And then, you know, looking at Jim Bob, what's he telling me to do? And then how he's processing all of those things as well, which I think is another indication of, you know, just – the maturity and the professionalism that he brings. The the uh, so when Anthony was coming out of college, there were a lot of questions about his accuracy, and people who, you know, maybe didn't watch a whole lot of it, will look at this game on Sunday and say he won eleven to twenty five. He's not accurate. Dan Orlovsky tweeted this: Go watch the throw he had to Josh Downs and tell me that's not an accurate quarterback. The, the seam ball that he just ripped 40 yards in the air on a line. I mean, my goodness. Like, and, and the throws, by the way, the throws that he's making short over the middle, he's been accurate on. Those are throws that he didn't do a lot at Florida that now we're seeing, hey, no, he can make those throws in the NFL. You can build on the deep ball ability that he has. Like, the Colts are running a lot of deep balls for Anthony, we're starting to see it more and more, and he can get the ball there on time with accuracy, whether he's got Aaron Donald wrapping him up or not. And then you think about, okay, if you have to start defending the deep ball, and you got to back off a little bit, maybe playing a little bit more man coverage. If you play man coverage against Anthony Richardson, he's going to gash you for 100 yards on the ground. It's so much fun to just to think about the different ways that Shane Steichen can now go, okay, hey, four games in, three starts in, you know, whatever it may be. Now the league's got some film on him. What's the counterpunch? And start thinking about what Shane's going to do with Anthony to counterpunch now how teams are going to start playing the Colts now that there's film on him in the NFL. My level of trust with Shane Steichen in there is super high, calling the plays, scheming things up. My level of trust in Anthony Richardson and the explosive playmaking ability he has is really high. He's going to face some different kinds of defenses. Tennessee's got a really good defense. Cleveland's got a great defense with Jim Schwartz there. New Orleans always has a really good defense. Jacksonville's doing some stuff. They just shut down Atlanta over the weekend. Um, It's going to be a really fun test over these next couple of games to see what the Colts can do on offense. Can't wait. One of the best there is. Uh, I want to give a shout out. We do that now and again. I think you're going to help me out with this one. Richardson to Ogletree. Is this something that's going to come on for the next decade with this stuff? A healthy Drew Ogletree there. We saw what he could do, but I just want to give him a shout-out. He had his first NFL touchdown. He's uh, contagious with the way that he is on the sidelines and in the locker room. Couldn't happen to a greater young man like that, but I'm happy because he can stink and play. Oh, my gosh. I talked to him this week for Colts 360. Had him back here in the studio, and he asked him what he did with the touchdown ball because now this is like my first question to the tight ends because Kylan Granson, I made sure he got the touchdown ball. I neglected to ask his plans for the infamous uh, photo shoot uh, that he had afterwards. So now it's it's question number one to any Colts tied in because what a dynamic group that uh, that room is right now. Uh, I asked Drew what he was doing touch- with that touchdown ball and he said, going straight to mom. There and he was go. so happy, so excited. He said she's been there with me through everything. Um, and he told me after the game that the, his only regret was that, you know, his son wasn't there to witness it. But I said, that just means you got to get a couple more TDs. So you got plenty to, to spread yeah, he'll around. Get some more. He will. He will certainly get some more. He has earned that for sure. And one of the things that I asked him in our conversation uh, within the show this week was just – We saw him go down in training camp last year, torn ACL, when he was so impressive all through camp. Expectations were so high. And 
Like what kept him so optimistic and so steady through that process? Because you guys, we're in here all off season when most of the players are gone. Drew was here through ev- I mean everything. I can't think of a single week of like February, March, April, where you didn't see Drew in here for hours in the training room, you know, rehabbing, conditioning, doing all of those things. And he said, it's my support system. He said, absolutely my family. He said, all of those trainers back there, everyone having just belief in me. He said, it was, it was hard. And like, he never showed that. He is the most, he just exudes positivity all the time. This is a guy who plays with so much just passion and excitement and genuine love of football and you never saw his struggle in the offseason he never you know put that out there to anyone he just kept grinding and stuck with the process and trusted the doctors and trusted the medical team to get back to it and my goodness if you saw I mean you saw the reaction from all of the tight ends if you'd had eyes on the entire like medical team too, they were right there with him celebrating to see Drew get back there after all that he's been through in the last, you know, what, 13 months or so. All right, that's Lara Overton, J.J. Stankovitz. Uh, I am Jeffrey Gorman. We do this week in and week out, courtesy of our friends at Win Las Vegas. Final thoughts coming up, but we got a reminder here, Inside Football with Rick Venturi, which came out on Wednesday, giving you the blueprint for the Colts to beat the Titans in Week 5. Look for that, another episode of the Colts' official podcast. It's going to land Thursday here with Matt Taylor, Casey Vallier, Bill Brooks, and a player which will be joining the pod with a look ahead to Sunday's game against the Titans. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right here. Thank you for viewing. Doing. Drop us a comment. I'll be answering some listener questions as well as JJ will help and Lara. In yeah, if you got, if you have, uh, you'll be answering. Yeah, if you my, if you have questions about the Colts, we are you know, all, ta- we all toss them in here. I'll try to get yeah, them in the uh, in. weekly mailbag I do on Colts.com. I'm a Couch fan, and if you guys want to rip yeah. me for that, go ahead. You can do it on that. I mean, especially this one. Would you rather? Ha- okay. Would you rather? All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, hold on a minute. Let me finish out strong here, at least comfortable. And so, is this like right. wh- where is this? Where is this? Like all right, be. there you go. Where's this couch <laughs> in the rankings? If you if you're going from like Tim to uh, I knew I knew got it at that Goodwill. Had... That's my ranking. No, 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 Tim couch. Yeah. Oh, Tim Get it? couch. Yeah. yeah. I thought you said uh, where does yeah. this rank? Yeah, I was. This gonna... is actually better better career this couch than Tim <laughs> couch had, I think. Yeah, and I love Tim couch. It's got more use in the NFL. Yeah, a little bit right there. Brought to you again by our friends at Win Las Vegas. Lara, anything final thought? JJ, final thought? We're going to do this. We're going to be ready because we're going to get back on track this week. Four out of five games over the course of October at Lucas Oil Stadium. You absolutely have to capitalize. The AFC South, everyone is all tied up at two and two. Four-way tie across the division. This is where you have to get a little bit of separation and capitalize on some opportunities when you do have division games at home because that's going to be what's critical as we've seen time and time again between deciding you know the AFC South deciding wild card spots all of that and you can't dig yourself into a deficit within the division early on in the season and anticipate trying to play catch up uh, later on so hey Colts fans keep doing your thing at Lucas Oil Stadium because it is noticed it is impacting uh, the product on the field for sure and there's certainly going to be a lot to be excited about as we do look to these upcoming three games out of the next four. Yeah our guys are going to get into the Titans game on Thursday on Thursday's pod but this is a comment we got from the Flame Keepers on YouTube last week. After having been out toughed by the Titans for the last four plus matchups, it's about time that the Colts bring a culture of toughness and start being the more physical team on the field on any given Sunday. It's there. It's There's going to be a brawl Definitely on Sunday at Luke Soil toughness. Stadium. Speaking of toughness, lastly, did you get the hubcap fixed on the car? No. Mm. Jeffrey, you, I've, that, that I mean, hubcap is... You're representing uh, the Colts I mean, now. Now, come on now. I okay. mean, he, just, he looks like he's collecting recyclables now because he doesn't have a... Uh, he doesn't have a hubcap Listen, on Listen, so, okay, so we're, we're driving a, a beat-up Toyota Camry because we're paying a billion dollars a year to child care. Shout-out to Primrose. Great great daycare. You guys do a great job, but it costs a lot of money. So, no, we're not putting – I'm not even bothering putting a hubcap on that car. That thing's got 150,000 miles on it. I will drive that into the ground, that Toyota Camry, because – I'm not buying a new car while I'm paying for daycare. Absolutely not. You could always replace it in a parking lot. You know that, right? Okay, I'll take your hubcap. I'm just saying. Well, mine. I now know what your car looks like, so I'm taking your hubcap. (laughs) I can't talk. I got a cracked windshield that I need to get. Yeah, I yell. I yell. Yeah, you. You. You're yelling at me about my hubcap, and I'm like, Jeffrey, when are you getting that windshield fixed? And you just drove off. I know, but I I want them to come to me, like their commercial says. But I can't with that one. I got to take it to them. So. Oh really? Yeah, with my windshield. Anyway, long story (laughs) short, listen, we're fired up as you can tell. At Lara Overton on X. At uh, JJ Stankovic 
us on X, formerly known as Twitter. I'm at Hey Gorman. We do it week in and week out. Be sure to catch everything you can on Colts.com. This divisional rivalry is hot. It's here, and it is at home this Sunday. The Titans coming to town to take on the Colts. We'll see you on Colts.com, and we'll definitely see you on Sunday.